Hi, I'm attorney Gregory Dell here with attorney Rachel Alters. And we're going to talk about applying for long-term disability benefits with New York Life Insurance Company. And Rachel, there was a merger recently between Cigna and New York Life. Cigna was one of the world's largest disability insurance companies. And now with the combination of New York Life, they'll clearly be one of the top three biggest uh, group disability insurance companies. So we're going to target this towards how to apply for group disability benefits. It's very similar for individual and New York Life did already have some individual coverage, but they're new to the ERISA because they never had claims that were governed by the ERISA laws, which are very strict, very time compliant and provide, you know, kind of a, a roadmap and a guideline for what the New York Life has to do in, in evaluating these claims. And a lot of people can get a flavor for how New York Life's gonna handle these claims by going back and looking at all of our information that we have for Cigna, which is also available on our webpage. Because basically, Cigna coming over to New York Life was just kinda like, it was a purchase, yes, for almost $6 billion, but they basically just took all of those people and now said, oh, you, you were a Cigna employee, now you're a New York Life employee. And everything else is pretty much gonna stay the same. So. When you get a call now from someone who's going to say, I have New York Life and I need to apply, what do you think in your mind compared to all these other companies that are out there? Um, well, I, you know, knowing New York Life and Cigna, both the companies are, you know, they're not going to just go ahead and approve benefits right away. Unfortunately, what these insurance carriers try to do with most claimants is they try and deny the claim. So I'm always very cautious with my my claimants and I try and guide them and tell them it's very important that we have really good medical care and really good medical notes um, and tell you know I try and, and guide my clients to 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 guide their physicians in how to document for a, a disability claim because most physicians aren't trained to document for disability claims they're trained to treat patients, to write medical notes. Most of them are illegible. Um, and I try and guide my clients to, to teach and train their own physicians about what they need when, you know, when filing for a disability claims. So that's, that's where I go with my, my claimants. And, and how important is that medical documentation if it isn't complete and it doesn't have the things that need to be in there Explain someone you know who's new to this process. How thorough is it going to be reviewed? Well, that's the first thing that that Cigna and New York Life do is they're going to review the medical records. And if their own peer-reviewed physicians don't believe that there's enough objective evidence in the medical records showing that the claimant is disabled and unable to do their job, then what they're going to do is just deny the claim. And it's going to be based solely on you know not that. The, the, the diagnosis doesn't exist because oftentimes you see in the denial letters, we're not you know, denying that this claimant was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. But what we are denying is that there's not enough restrictions and limitations documented in their medical records to indicate that they're not able to perform their job duties. So we really like to focus on getting those medical records very detailed to the point where you look at medical records, you open them up and you can see the patient is having difficulties, you know, sitting for long periods, they're unable to focus at work, their memory is not good, whatever issues that the, the claimant is having, the doctor needs to document them and be very specific because if they're not documented, then they don't exist. So with these New York Life policies, they're group policies and, and governed by ERISA, and most group policies say that you have to be employed at the time that you become disabled. The cases that are challenging, Rachel, which is 95% of them, are the people who have these chronic medical conditions. It's not the person who, God forbid, got hit by a Walmart truck and has a broken back and is going to be out for a year. Those cases aren't hard. Those are, those are easy to initially get the claim approved. So the very common scenario that we face is the person has a chronic medical illness, has a, um, a diagnosis of some kind of disease or something that happened within the past six months or 12 months, and they've been trying to work through it. And then 
they've been treating with the doctors for six months or 12 months, and then they may reach the point where they feel in their own mind they can't keep going at work anymore, and they file their claim. And the common denial that we see from New York Life is that, well, we don't doubt that, as you said earlier, diagnosis, you know, you have your diagnosis, but that doesn't equal disability. And you continued to work for six months to a year with this medical condition. So why now are you telling us that you're disabled? We, we, we're, you know, we're not going to pay you. And so now we're talking about here, how do we help someone to get approved for disability? How do you anticipate that when you're helping someone in the application process? Yeah, and that's one of the first things I ask when, when a claimant will call and ask for legal advice about their disability claim. I will say, well, when was this diagnosis made? And, you know, oftentimes they'll tell me, oh, I was diagnosed six months ago or a year ago or even, you know, several years back. And over the years, it's just gotten worse and I've just, I can't take it anymore. I'm, I'm super stressed at work and the stress is causing, you know, my condition to worsen. So the first thing I say to them is, well, we have to make sure that the medical records indicate that your condition has progressed because if your doctors are writing the same thing every time you come in and visit them whether it's once a month once every two months once every three months then the insurance carrier is going to go well, nothing's changed and you've been working for the past six months to a year with the same condition so why is it now that you suddenly can't work um, and that's when the claims get denied because there's no there's no indication in the medical records that shows that the condition progressed, whether it's through the doctors just documenting that this, you know, your pain is worse, your focus and inattention has gotten worse, or whether they've had, you know, labs that have gotten worse, or there's been other testing that they've done that's indicated that the condition is worsened. So it's one of the first things I do address with my, my clients because I think it's really important for them to know what they need to be telling their doctors when they go in for their visits. And then, Rachel, I want to, so we, we really stress the importance of how important medical documentation is, medical support from not only just your one doctor, but multiple doctors. There must be consistency amongst the doctors because, you know, if there's three doctors and one disagrees, they're just going to take the one who said, oh, I think that there aren't restrictions and limitations. And if they got a leg to stand on to deny the claim, they're going to take it every day of the week. So got to get real good support, which will work with you to make sure that's there before submitting a claim. And like you just said before, if you get a claim and of course you review all the medical records, if it doesn't look ready and the person is fortunately has called us before they stop working, there's times where we have to say, you're going to have to stick it out because we got to get better documentation because you're only as your claim is only as good as you look messed up on paper. If you don't look messed up in that paper, then you're gonna have a hard time getting approved. And we really gotta make sure everything's in there and supported enough to get you approved. But I wanna to shift to then, there's the medical, but the second component of having a successful application with New York Life is proving your occupational duties. And you know that often in these New York Life policies, you start off with an own occupation definition of disability, which is unable to perform the duties of your own occupation. But it's not really your own occupation because they often have this national economy definition of disability. So talk about what the national economy definition of disability is and then what you do when you're representing a claimant to support additional, additional information of what the person's occupational duties really are. Sure. Um, and most of these group policies, you know, they will, and, and most people don't really read the policies, or if they read it, they don't really understand what the true definition of own occupation is under these group policies. So when you read them, it says, you know, are you able to do the material substantial duties of your own occupation? And your own occupation is not the occupation that you perform every single day in the office you work. It is the occupation as it's defined in the national economy. And people say, well, what does that mean? And I say, well, it means that if you go on to Google and you go into the dictionary of occupational titles and you type in your occupation, so if it's paralegal, that will come up and they will list, you know, maybe five, six different job duties that are required in a paralegal in the national economy. Well, most of my clients will say to me, well, Rachel, the half of my job duties aren't included in that list. I'm required to travel. I'm required to lift 
heavy files. I have all these other duties that, that they're not listed there. So how is that fair? And I said, actually, it's not fair. It's how the policies are written. And technically, they only need to look at the Dictionary of Occupational Titles, and they can deny you based on just what those occupations are listed. But what I always do is I make sure that my clients you know, create a list of occupational duties and write their own personal statement um, describing what, you know, what their work duties are and what they're required to do that are beyond that list. So that when the insurance carrier gets them, hopefully they will consider that there's other duties that, that are required for this person's job. Um, they're not required technically to consider them because according to the policy, they look at the job as it's described in the national economy. But no matter what, I always have those duties typed up and I have them explain in detail what their job entails and you know how their restrictions and limitations prevent them from being able to perform. Right, and we always know what they're gonna use as their national economy definition because we know the sources they go to, plus we have our own vocational rehabilitation experts that and consultants that we work with to say, who we reach out to and always say, what are they going to say is the national economy here? And often we have to say, you know what, that's not the national economy the way that you're trying to portray it and cut them off at the past to put in the information. The other thing, Rachel, is a lot of people start with an employer and they work with them for five years, 10, 15 plus years, right? And, and, and the employer gets asked for a job description. And very often the job description, you see this almost all the time, doesn't really match what that person's doing at the at the company because they started off at one thing and now they're like the vp of operations or whatever it is and there was no job description for that particular thing at the time or whatever their duties morphed into because you always start with one duty and then you end up taking on the jobs of five people that's just the way it goes at these companies everybody knows that so the job description never matches and unfortunately the employer in the hr department gets this form fills it out sends it in sends a job description, it doesn't match, and it creates a snowball effect, big problem, because when they do, when New York Life does their initial occupational evaluation, and they use their voc consultant, or they use that job description, they stick to that the whole time. It's like no one goes back and looks at it, they just take it as like, that's the Bible, that's what it is, we're gonna accept that's the way it was written, and it's, that's what it was. No one goes and looks at it again. And so we see so many claims that get denied because they're evaluating the occupation based upon something that, regardless of this national economy thing, is not the way in which the person did their job. So somebody, it's a simple problem to avoid by really being aware of what the occupational duties are. So Rachel, we, we talked about the um, the importance of the medical. We talked about having strong occupational duties. The, the last thing in this whole application process is people want to know time frames and, and expectations. You know, when do I have to notify the carrier? How long is this going to take? And, and just generally, you know, what's the average time from when I submit something that I should expect to get approval? Right. Um, it varies and every company is different and you know I tell everybody most policies require that you put the carrier on notice within 30 days from the date of your you know your injury and that you provide them with proof of loss within 90 days um, most of the companies require it you know no matter what within a year um, the question is when you submit the application how long do they have to review and give you a decision it varies. Um, I would say that you know, 90 days is a, you know, they're supposed to give a decision in 45 days, um, no longer than 90. It doesn't usually happen that way because along the way, the carrier is always asking for additional information. Once you send them the information, they always say they have 30 days to review that information. Um, if they end up sending the, you know, the, the medical records to a peer review, they always ask for an extension. So it varies. And you know, with COVID-19, now they're getting extensions for everything because now you know, the pandemic has made it very hard for medical records to get sent to these insurance carriers because some of the doctor's offices aren't open. So it's hard to say. We usually say it needs to be within a reasonable time. Um, and if the, you know, the response isn't given within 90 days, then you know, we start to put pressure on them to give an answer. Unfortunately, you know, sometimes it does take them longer depending on 
how extensive the medical records are and whether they're sending the claimants for independent medical evaluations. So it's a case by case basis. Um, yeah, it definitely it varies also, you know, what kind of packet I think we stated earlier in the video, we send in a very thorough packet. We try to get them every medical record, all the occupational information, financial documentation, everything they could ask for. So then if you're in that position, you can really put the heat on them to make it look like they're violating the ERISA regulations or the state insurance laws of being unreasonable. And that does hold a lot of weight against them because they don't want to be in violation of that because um, it can create regulatory issues for them and their company. And while not New York Life, but Cigna is no stranger to regulatory um, violations in the past many years ago where they had to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars in penalties and do reviews of old claims that they denied. So they don't like to be caught in that position. New York Life doesn't want to be in that position. So it's good to do it right the first time so you can really hammer them to get a decision in a timely manner. What I, what I highly recommend though for a claimant if you're watching this video is to go ahead and send us a copy of your policy. We'll provide you with a free consultation, an initial review of your entire claim, whether it's Rachel or myself, or you can fill out the free consultation form. It, that will come to us and we'll immediately set an appointment with you to go over that policy which will give you a good framework and a guide as to how we think we can help you and whether or not we think you have a reasonable chance of getting approved. And then the other thing obviously is go through our website, search your company, search up your medical condition or occupation. You're gonna get a lot of helpful information there that will put you in the best position possible to get your claim approved because you're gonna be far more educated after reading all of this information and watching videos. It's a new world for you, you you not, living this world like Rachel and I the past 20 years with disability claims day in, day out, knowing how they're going to behave. And while you probably already have a bad taste in your mouth for insurance companies in general, you can be prepared and you can get your claims approved, but you need to think like they think to have the best chance. So no matter where you live in the country, we help clients everywhere. We'll be here when you need us and we look forward to the opportunity to speak with you.